picture this. I'm 21 and I've just moved to Birmingham ahead of my final year of university. I'm also newly single, but I'm quite happy about that. I think I've got a full year ahead of me. It's my last year at uni, kind of lots of fun and frolicking around I can now do. So I get a home STI test. I didn't think I had anything. It was just a precautionary measure at the time. Wasn't until two weeks later, I was walking down a hospital corridor and a nurse looked back at me. And it was that look where you know something really bad is about to happen. So I called my mum and dad and I said, please, I need you to come now. I need you to get to Birmingham now. But they just rolled out of a tent at an 80s festival, very hungover, probably still drunk. And unfortunately, they were three and a half hours away. So they got straight in the car and they headed over to me and I just had to wait. I don't really remember what happened in that time. I think it was just all a bit of a blur. But when they finally got there, my mum gave me the biggest hug and she told me that everything was going to be all right. She really wanted to take me somewhere safe. And we were kind of racking our brain. Where could we go that's safe? Weatherspoons. So we walked to Weatherspoons and they bought me a big pint of creamy Guinness. And we went and sat outside in the beer garden. We weren't really talking about what was potentially happening to me at the time. We were just having a chat as a family. So my dad started like fully belly laughing, chuckling to himself. And he was like, Belle, which is my nickname. Belle, I think it's really important during all of this that you stay positive. (laughs) And he just laughed. And we all laughed. I think it was kind of this lifting moment that we needed at that time. Um, My mum and dad were really worried about me. I I was quite upset and distressed and they wanted to stay the night. But I said no. I wanted to go to the hospital tomorrow, the next day on my own. And I, I wanted to do it on my own. So the next day came around and I got up and I went to this HIV clinic. I walked in and a nurse greeted me and they took me to a private room. And they said there was a few formalities we had to go through. I I needed to have a prick test there to confirm that I was HIV positive. And at that point, I kind of thought, well, if I've got to do another test, this could all be maybe it's not maybe it's a mistake. I don't have it. So when they offered me a drink, I said no, because I thought I'd be in and out. So I sat down and she explained that this prick test would be a drop of blood from my finger. We'd sit and wait and it would say whether I was positive or not. So she pricked my finger, plonked the test on the table and we waited. She looked at me and said, I'm I'm really sorry, Ellie, it's positive. And I said, no, I want to do it again. I want to do the test again. And she said, that's fine. So she pricked my finger plonked the test on the table and we waited. She said, I'm really sorry, Ellie, it's positive. And I said, no, I want to do it again. I wanted to, please, can I do it again? I want to do it again. And she said, we could, but it had to be the last time. We'd do it one last time. So she pricked my finger, plonked the test on the table and we waited. And she said, I'm really sorry, Ellie, it's positive. What do you want to do now? And I said, I'll take that cup of tea now if it's okay." So the nurse stood up, left the room, and she bought me back a big mug of tea and a giant plate of biscuits. So straight away, I picked a biscuit up, dunked it in my tea. And I guess time just wasn't really passing like it normally does during that time. And my biscuit just disintegrated. And it flowed all the way to the bottom of this mug. And the nurse just took the tea from my hand, walked out of the room and brought me back a fresh mug. And it was kind of the first moment of kindness I've had during this really distressing period of time. She's then gone on to explain to me that there's this tablet, this tablet that would mean I I could never pass the virus on, that I I would live a normal kind of happy, healthy life. And I thought, "A, a magic pill, give me it. I'll have it now. I want it now. And she said, I'm really sorry. You've got to wait to see a doctor, which is going to be about two, three weeks. I'll have to wait to get the magic pill. And I said, no, I don't want to wait. I want it now. I need it now. If there's a pill that's going to make me better, I want it now. But there was nothing she could do. So she sent me home without it. 
And I called my dad that night and I I cried and I cried and I said, dad, I can't wait two weeks. What am I going to do in these two weeks? I can't wait. I need that pill. And he said, there's, there's nothing they can do, Ellie. You, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to wait. It will pass like no time. It will be fine. And I went to bed that night with the heaviest heart. And I just didn't know. I didn't know how I was going to do this. So nine o'clock the next morning, my phone rings and I answer and it's a nurse at the hospital. And she'd clearly taken pity on me for being quite distressed and said, we'll give you the pills. Come on in today and we'll give you the tablets. So I went in, I got my magic pill. I've then started taking it it's kind of two weeks on and I'm at the stage where we are finally at Freshers Week. Now, although I had the pill and I was starting to feel better, I didn't want anyone to know. I was still really ashamed and I didn't want anyone to know. So first day of Freshers rolls around and my best friend Caitlin went, let's go to a party. And I've gone exactly what I need to do go to a party so we went to this big house party there's lots of dancing lots of drinking lots of boys and all of a sudden no Caitlin so then I did a lot of dancing and a lot of drinking hung out with a lot of boys and then all of a sudden one of them tried it on with me now this is the first time since being diagnosed I'd I'd had that interaction I didn't know what to do so I cried and I really panicked and cried. And I was I was just this full emotional wreck. So the boys did what boys do best. And they put me in an Uber and shipped me off home. When I got back, I managed to find Caitlin. And by this stage, I'd been crying to the taxi driver and I was really distressed. So I kind of walked through our front door and I was like, Caitlin, Caitlin, I've got HIV. And I just kind of screamed at her. And I think I expected a big reaction. I kind of thought she was she was going to know nothing and it was going to be this big shock. But it wasn't at all. Caitlin knew about the magic pill. She knew that everything was going to be OK. And she told me that I had nothing to worry about and I could completely do this. I could totally get through this. Because Caitlin had been so great about it, I thought, I'll tell someone else. So shortly after, I think I told eight, nine, maybe even 10 of my friends. And I was pretty comfortable with that. At that stage, I knew I can't pass it on. And I'd said the same thing to them. What I meant by that is I don't want people to know. I don't want them to go around and tell everyone that I've got it or anything about it. I just want it to stay just us for now until I feel better. And they all said, fine. They said there was no issues with that. They promised, they promised they wouldn't tell anyone. We've then got another kind of eight, nine months of this final year, and it was fantastically fun. There was a lot of parties, a lot of just going out, and I think a lot of me being okay with where I was in the situation. So one Sunday afternoon, as we always ended up, we were in the pub, and one of the rugby lads comes kind of burling over to me, stumbling through, pint in hand, And he sits down next to me and he says, Ellie, are you okay? And I've gone, of course, why wouldn't I be in the pub? And he goes, we all know you're going through a lot. If you ever need anyone, you can come talk to us. And I sat and I thought about what he just said. And I think a light bulb went off in my head. He knew, he knew that I had HIV. But it wasn't just him that knew. The whole rugby team knew. The whole football team knew. The whole of campus knew. And I think what it felt like to me, the whole of Birmingham City Centre might well have known. But they didn't know that I was okay. People weren't saying that Ellie is undetectable, Ellie can't pass it on, Ellie's living a great life. They were all worried about me. People were getting quite upset and distressed. Like there was something I had to be ashamed of or there was really something wrong with me. And I got really angry about that because I just, I didn't know how to explain to these people that wasn't the case. So I thought back to what a great prophet had once said to me, my dad, on the day that I was diagnosed. And he said, stay positive. Now I felt at that time like it was tattooed on my forehead. So I did the only thinkable thing. And I got it tattooed on my middle finger. 
Now, this to me was a big F you to anyone that wanted to pity me, anyone that wanted to say I wasn't okay. I was completely fine and living a fantastic life. I've then been so fortunate over the last kind of four and a half years where I've been lucky enough to go on TV and share my story. I've done a lot of incredible articles and fantastic work, and I've met wonderful people through living with HIV. And during that process, what I've learned is I can't pass it on. I cannot pass on HIV. But what I can pass on is a huge amount of education and knowledge. A lovely bit of hope for people newly diagnosed or just don't know how to cope with it, or even someone that knows someone with it and they don't know how to react. So if you can do anything when you leave this call tonight, have a think about the things that you can and can't pass on. So you cannot pass on stigma. You cannot pass on judgment and nasty words. But you can pass on that there's a magic pill. You can pass on that you should be getting regular tests. One, one test like that could change your life. And I think the most important thing that we really need to remember is that you should always stay positive.